testify of his goodness with a shout. Express your confidence in him with another shout. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for elevation. It is the joy of the whole world. It is Mount Zion and it is the city of the great king. Father, we thank you because Zion is with us and we are in Zion. Thank you, Jesus. Praise him. Father, we worship you. Praise the Lord. is good come on come on come on come on let's be seated oh yes oh yes oh yes God bless you guys appreciate you greatly oh come on you know the Bible says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were in one place and in one accord we used to have to call like two or three meetings to decide whether to have service on a holiday or not. Emails used to fly back and forth. Y'all who were here, you know what I'm saying. It used to be, it's on, it's off. Uh, we don't know. What's the weather going to be like? Is there a cookout people are going to? It used to be a pandemonium. But look at us now. In one accord by the grace of God. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Praise the Lord. We didn't have to call a meeting. He was just like, yeah. Uh, there's a holiday on Tuesday. Okay. If anybody wants to go eat somewhere, they can go and come back here. Alan, it's Alan's mother's birthday today. And in the morning he was like, oh, we're just going to stop by on our way to church. And I'm like, I like the sound of that. You see, we're in everything else that we do, no matter how important it is, because it is important to celebrate one's mom's birthday. But we just do that knowing fully well that there is a higher calling. And I'm just so excited, you know, the heart with which, you know, one person here in particular used to be a holiday major. She used to be like, y'all know there's a holiday coming, right? But this time around, I was like, okay, well, let's find out from Anita. I mean, sorry, from this person. <laughs> Oh my God, how did I just do you like that? Oh yeah, yeah, come on. She was like, <laughs> and I was like, uh, she was passing by, I was like, Anita, what do you think? There's a holiday next week, she was like, I'll be here. That was what she said, I'm like, there you have it. If Anita is here, come on. And we're just so thankful because Anita is fully here today because her husband is here too, Brother Collins, good to see you. God is good. Amen, 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 praise the Lord. So that much, oh yeah, yeah, and, and, and he's also my wife's brother. In case you all don't know, they come from the same hometown, you know, back in Nigeria. So um, yeah, we, you couldn't have planned that. It's just divine orchestration. You know, when God sends you to a land far away from home, Jesus says, as many of you, for as many of you as have left brother, father, mother, sister, for my sake, you will find them in this life and in the one to come. You know, so many... Many people we have had to leave behind in Nigeria and in England and in Canada. But since we have been in America, in obedience to the commandment of God over our lives, we have found brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers. And so it is all the divine orchestration of God. You know, and just so that we have proof, their daughter actually looks like my wife more than our daughter looks like her. So that no one is in doubt. Praise the Lord. Oh yeah, God is good. Uh, and then when you have young men who have a thousand and one things to do, call you saying, we are coming on Tuesday, there's going to be a service. Then you know that the Holy Spirit is moving over hearts. 
You know, when Emmanuel reached out to me, you know, I would have thought someone as popular as Emmanuel, as busy, as young, with everybody seeking his attention. You know, when you're tall, dark, handsome, and you're just 20-something, when there's a holiday, you want to be at every cookout. But he called me. He was like, Pastor, I ain't, I, I'm not doing anything. I'm coming. Oh, yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord. Come on. Oh, yeah, yeah. God is good. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, you, I'm just so excited that we, we, we didn't have to coax anyone or plead with anybody or beg anybody. Everyone came here today who is here present. And I want us to do something very significant. We haven't done this in a while. If you would just take your hand and just place it upon your neighbor and just say, well done. Yes, well done, you good and faithful servant. Praise the Lord. You see, because... We, we are supposed to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. We need to make sure that whatever the Lord wants us to do is what we do. That's what makes us good and faithful servants. God is good. I'm excited to be here. You can tell. And so today we will go right into a couple of things, um, but not until I've shared with us a prophetic update in just a couple of minutes. Up until then, I want you to prophesy over somebody. You understand what I mean? I want you to, um, like Alan was telling us earlier on, there's, it is important for us to be very intentional about using the resources that God has given to us. You, you understand what I mean? You know, and um, praise God, that sounds great. God is good. And by the way, it was nice to actually, you know, hear more of Brother Ron today, you know, on the band. God is good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Praise, praise the Lord. And so, I want us to pray for somebody today. And I don't want us to just do it as though we're buying time until the hour of prophetic update comes. Because we are already in the hour. But the Bible says that he has given gifts unto men. We are the gifts that Jesus was promised by his heavenly father. When David prophesied, he said the Lord has received gifts from the rebellion. We are of the order or we were of the rebellion. We were born into sin. We grew up rebelling against the commandments of God because of the fact that we came according to the similitude of the first man that fell. But the Lord has chosen to receive us unto himself as gifts from the rebellion. And so because we know that we have the gifts that he has received, not just to keep to himself, but to give to the world. I want you to know that you as a bundle, you as an individual in existence, you are a bundle of heaven's gifts to the world. So be a blessing to somebody today. Lay your hands on somebody and prophesy. And just declare over them out of the goodness of your heart. Because the Bible says a good man, out of his good treasures, brings forth things that are both old and new. I want you to bring out of the resources that God has given to you because it is more blessed to give than to receive. And say that this very hour, even this very moment, someone will receive an utterance of blessing. I want to encourage you to open your mouth and pronounce a blessing. Because by so doing, you are making room in your heart and within yourself to receive even a greater blessing. You're not doing it because of what you're going to get, but you're doing it knowing fully well that once done in obedience and out of a clean heart, you will receive more than you gave. Alrighty, so the hour of the prophetic update has come. And it is in Jeremiah chapter 27, verse 12. We will go to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 27, verse 12. I'm going to wait for the people whose prophetic utterance is still flowing. I want you to, um, 
I want every one of us to be there together. Jeremiah chapter 1, I mean chapter 27 verse 12. Hallelujah. So, um, Mamborodos Kotolotit Kin to Skundu Gudomanda Lia Ramakukum de la Dedi Lavosa. Now, let me just quickly um, tell you what just happened. Many of us needed to be reminded of who we are. We are God's partners. And He says, You shall be my witnesses. The reason why many of us are not fully operating in that capacity of being the witness of the anointing. Remember that it was the anointing that was speaking. You see, when the Bible says, and Christ said, the word Christ is the word anointing. It means the anointed one and his anointing. And so the anointing spoke saying, you shall be my witnesses. And so if you are a witness to the anointing, then that means you are a witness to breakthroughs because the Bible says by reason of the anointing, yokes shall be broken. The anointing of God that is upon your life is for other people. The word of God that is within your heart is for you. So when you receive a word of God or from God, it positions you for the anointing. And once the anointing becomes functional, or let me put it correctly in heaven's grammar, once you become functional in the anointing, See, because the anointing on its own is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The anointing is always functional. The anointing of God that is upon your life is always functional. But you need to begin to function in the anointing. Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. So now I need to function. Was that not what he said? He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. To do what? To function to preach the gospel to the poor. Everything he described is what the anointing does. To open the eyes of the blind, to set the captives free. And not only did Jesus set the captives free, it took captivity itself, captive, just to ensure that you don't accidentally fall into captivity again. And when you look at that, you need to see who you are. You need to see yourself as the one that has been anointed because you have been appointed. Let me say this again. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. You see, to have the Spirit of God upon you means that you have been appointed by God for a purpose. When Saul was appointed to be king over Israel, what happened was he became anointed. I say all of that because of what I'm about to read to y'all. So keep your Bible in Jeremiah chapter 27, verse 13. The Holy Spirit wants me to make clear to you what we did. When I said pray for one another, you know what was going on was we were being awakened to who we are in Christ Jesus. I want you to say that I am appointed. Okay, now let me read to you Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 1, and I want us to pay very close attention to the way the word of God or scripture introduces Jeremiah. You know, anyone thankful that we've been reading and studying and reading from Jeremiah a lot lately? 
I hope you're even more excited after you see this, if you haven't seen it before, if it hasn't been revealed to you before now. The words, this is Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 1. The Bible says the words of Jeremiah, the son of Ilkahiah, of the priests who were in Anathor. I want us to read that very first part again. The words of who? The Bible did not say the word of God. The Bible says the words of Jeremiah. <laughs> you see, there is a revelation and an awareness that you will have that would allow for heaven to recognize what is coming out of your mouth. You know, once before I said to you that the difference between a prophet and a seer is that a seer says what he sees, but a prophet sees what he says. Because you become functional. When you become functional in the anointing, you come to be in sync with the anointed one. And you know the anointed one who is called the Christ is also the word of God that becomes or that became flesh so that you also can become the word of God. The Lord is waking us up to the authority that he has given to us as the ones that he anointed because he has appointed them for a purpose. And we're about to see now, let me just quickly jump the gun here. When you prayed for whoever you prayed for, the intention of heaven was for you to announce the answer to their prayers. I didn't tell you that because of the fact that the Lord wanted us to perform it first and then come to have a realization of it afterwards so that we are not trying to engineer the workings of God because it's supposed to be fluid it's meant to be by the spirit so whatever it was that you were doing was being a witness to the anointing in the lives of those you prayed for and haven't heard and participated in that you are now supposed to now go on from here intentionally being an answer to the prayers of others as a witness, so that you don't come under the pressure and say, oh, I have to answer Emmanuel Leader's prayers. No, you are a witness to the word of God that is the answer to her prayers. But submitting yourself intentionally to function in that capacity makes you an angel. Because angels deliver answers to prayers. And what did the Lord remind us of again on Saturday? That the ones who choose to become angels in the lives of other people, themselves, they begin to move in the company of innumerable angels. I will tell you more about what we're doing, but first of all, Matthew chapter 11 verse 10, the Bible introduces John the Baptist as an angel. The Bible says an angel of the Lord. Your English translation would say a messenger of the Lord will go before you. Every single one of us who are supposed to be the messenger that comes before the Christ. You are meant to be a witness. And what does that mean? You are meant to prophesy. So even before the anointing is evidently seen in its capacity to break yokes, you are supposed to have said something about it. For the Lord said, will I do a thing without first of all revealing it to myself as the prophet? You see, what the Lord is doing here is the Lord is awakening the prophetic that is on the inside of you because that's why he brought you here. I believe that one of my primary assignments by God is to produce after my kind. 
Because the Bible says, kind begets kind. And that was how it was in the beginning. And the word of the Lord says, so shall it be all through time that a seed will become a tree that will bear fruits, that will contain seeds that are able to reproduce after its kind. So a prophet is supposed to not just prophesy because if a prophet focuses only on prophesying, what happens at the end of his ministry? Are we going to be left without the prophetic in the body of Christ because someone only used their gifts without reproducing their gift? And so the Lord has brought you here because of the fact that he knows what he has already put on the inside of you that needs to be activated by one who has already operated in it. The Bible says that the gifts of God, not the gifts of a man, no one has anything to give except that which he also has received. But the Bible says we have received freely, so we give freely. That's why you're not paying to attend a course to attain the power of God because no one can pay for it. You know, people can pay for all kinds of things to keep other people busy and out of the streets, but the reality of it is that which matters and that which carries the potency of the anointing can only be communicated freely. Now, here is the word, what the Word of God says. The Bible says that the gift of God that is on the inside of you is stirred up by the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, which means the eldership. To be an elder doesn't mean gray beard and dyed hair. I mean, like gray hair. <laughs> it means to have been in a place. Let faith rise up within you to receive and embrace that which the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. My word today to you is that you will begin to move in the power of the Holy Spirit as one that has been appointed by God who is also aware of it enough to partner with heaven such that the way God watches over his words to perform them, heaven begins to watch over your words to perform them. The Bible says the words of Jeremiah. What is the meaning of Jeremiah? I've said it like maybe 15 times already. Anybody knows? Jeremiah means God's appointed one. You are God's Jeremiah. And can I prove to you that you are God's Jeremiah? When God called Jeremiah, what he said was what you said. When God called Jeremiah, Jeremiah was like, are you talking to me? Like me? All of that stuff? Me? You see what I mean? Because the reason why many of us haven't fully stepped into what God has for us is not because he hasn't told us. He has whispered it to you, but you're still waiting for another to come and answer the call. Well, conversely, on occasions, that is true because the one that receives the word sometimes is not the one that answers it. You need to become another man in order to answer the call of God. So when the word of the Lord came to you, you were like Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, I, I am but a youth. And the Lord said to him, do not repeat that statement. He says, don't say that. You may have been a youth up until now. But right now, you are becoming another man. You are becoming an appointed, and heaven does not appoint children. The Bible says an offspring, while he is still a child, does not differ from a servant. Who shall commit to such a one the riches and the inheritance of the kingdom? So heaven does not appoint children. So when the Lord calls you, is appointed. That means you are no longer where you are. Jeremiah became a son at the word of the Lord. The Bible says, unto us a child is born, and then unto us a son is given. Jesus became a son 
not because he had lived for 30 years, but because the father says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so I pray for you today. In fact, the Lord says to say it like you heard it. I declare over you today in the name of the father, in the name of the son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, that you are saying goodbye to childishness. You are saying goodbye to what? Childishness. The Bible says that children, they have the capacity to harbor foolishness. The Bible says in the heart of a little child, foolishness is bound. What is foolishness? To be a fool is to not acknowledge God. So there are instances wherein you become afraid of things because you fail to acknowledge God. Because if you know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, you will not be afraid. Children do things for their pleasure. So a lot of things that God has been asking you to let go of because it pleases you, you have refused to let go of it. Those things are toys that keep you little. But when the Lord says to declare over you today that you are putting away childishness, know that you are now walking in the footsteps of the apostles that went before you. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought as a child. I even understood as a child. But he said, but now... I put away childish things. A moment comes like it came in the life of Jeremiah wherein he was able to put away childish things. One moment of divine encounter can grow you into the stature of a man. It is not magic, it is process. If Adam got up from the dust in one day as a man, who says that the Lord cannot do the same for you? Who says that your heavenly father's words concerning you, assuring you that like Jeremiah, you can put away childish things. Like Paul, you can put away childish things. Who says that you cannot go from here not to return to your toys anymore, but to go home as a son following the leading of the Holy Spirit? You know, that is what it means to be a son. Who says that God cannot do the same for you? And I say that he has done the same for you. Because he says, now I put away childish things. So you're going forth from here no longer struggling with the things that you struggled with as a babe in Christ. Not able to believe babe in Christ. Not able to study the word of God, babe in Christ. Not able to pray, babe in Christ. Not able to forgive, babe in Christ. Not able to stand boldly against the opposition of Satan, babe in Christ. But I say to you today, now you put away childish things. Are you going to miss those things? Maybe. But the Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons. The children are led by their flesh, but you'll be led by the Spirit. Because God said to me that today it is about what I need to get done. You see, because every one of us were made here, we were sent here as an avenue for God Almighty to show forth His praise. We are here for His glory. And for some of us, it's like the Father is done waiting for us. Because Jeremiah was not about to keep God waiting. When he said, oh, but I am but a youth, he was hoping for a sabbatical. He was hoping that God would say, okay, okay, should we come back in seven years? Maybe you'll be ready. All right, Michael, saddle the horse. Let's go home. God was like, no, no, don't say that anymore. You are ready because we need you to begin to speak the word of your heavenly Father as a witness, so that it will be said one day, the words of Moses Anderson, the words of Rosemary, the words of Kenyatta, the words of Jordan, the words of Jeremiah. And you know, he was the son of Ilkahiah, and I believe Ilkahiah means one that, is, that has found the favor of God. 
Because we do all of those things because we have what? Because we have the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But I'm only stopping there. The word Ilkahaya means the portion, that the Lord is my portion. You see? Interestingly, I wasn't even thinking about it, but that was what I just told you. That we here are heaven's opportunity for the manifestation of the Almighty God. And so the Lord is your portion in the land of the living. And so the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the son of Ilkahiah, who was a priest of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. You know what Anathoth means? Anathoth means answered prayers. So the Lord has appointed you to be his witness. And because of your appointment, your steps are to be quickened unto righteousness, to put away childish things and carnality, to become one that is led by the Spirit so that you can be entrusted with the unction, the function in the anointing as one who is an avenue for heaven's manifestation on the earth for one purpose, so that you can be a priest of answered prayers. We have such a privilege in him. You know, when people realize their privilege, they begin to carry themselves differently. If you know that you have been privileged to have authority in the court of law, as the judge, you don't argue with anybody. Two litigation attorneys can be yelling at each other, but they dare not yell at the judge. And the judge does not join them in arguing. He just tells them with his hammer to shut up. That's because he knows that he has the privilege of authority. The reason why you can become a son at the voice of God is because when the Lord comes to you to awaken your awareness of your privilege, you no longer drag yourself in the mud. You no longer pee on yourself. Because now you are putting away childish things, realizing who you have become. I say this, folks, today because, oh, well, I say this because we're about to get into some prophetic updates, but the Lord is not dishing out this update to just anybody. He is handing these updates out to his prophets. He says, will I do a thing without revealing it to my servants, the prophets. And that is the reason why the Lord would have me explain to you what I have just explained to you so that you can then have a consciousness of the privilege that you have of being a worthy recipient by grace of this update that the Lord has for us. Because until you know who you are, you cannot fully utilize what you have. Until you know who you have, I mean, who you are. You see, because if you don't know that you are Josephine, you cannot use Josephine's driver's license. Imagine if one day Josephine wakes up and she thinks she's Manuelita. Then she will be waiting for someone to do her hair. Whereas she is the one that does hair. But if she, yeah, no, yeah, we've seen your handiwork. That's why I'm using you as an example. You understand what I mean? So knowing who you are allows for you to begin to use what you have. So if I know that I am Moses Anderson, I can use Moses Anderson's driver's license. I can use his bank account. I can use his wristwatch because I know that it is mine. 
And you know what's interesting? Is that sometimes when you also know whose you are, then you begin to use what they have. Because my son knows he is my son. He will go to school sometimes in a shoe that I just bought. And then when I am picking up, picking him up from school, I'm like, wow. Jesus has done it again. This shoe has multiplied. Because that must not be the one that I was waiting for Saturday to wear. Because there are times where I am saving that shoe for when Natalie is having a fashion parade. Maybe I will accidentally hit the runway. But then he will just wear it because he knows whose he is. Let us go to Jeremiah chapter 27 verse 12. This is the word of the Lord. The Bible says, I also spoke to Zedekiah, king of Judah, according to all these words saying, bring your neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and live. Let's go to verse 14. Therefore, do not listen to the words of the prophets who speak to you saying, you shall not serve the king of of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you. Why is it important and significant? These people were going through a period of testing. And the Lord set up the king of Babylon to be a taskmaster over them. And here the word of the Lord is saying, this is where we have come to. Wherein there are certain situations that are arising upon the earth. That we need to be able to navigate. Let me go back to 13 that we skipped and it will begin to get clearer. Now, verse, in fact, before we read verse 13, let's quickly go to verse 4. Verse 4 says, And command them to say to their masters, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Thus you shall say to your masters, I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are on the ground by my great power, and by my outstretched arm, and have given it to whom it seemed proper to me. And now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. I'm about to change your prayer life by the Holy Ghost. You see, the king of Babylon is not who you would think is working for God. Those who walk by sight and take their instructions from the religious mind will miss what God is doing in these last days. Because it is the ones that actually look like the angel of light that are of the order of wickedness. Many people, what I have just said to you, has become a political millstone around the neck of certain people in this land and beyond because some of the ones that they have chosen for themselves that they have attributed righteousness to are essentially 
Satan disguised as an angel of light. They call man messiahs because the power of the great deception has allowed for men to receive the antichrist as the Christ. I say to you, do not join them to follow another by your own human assessment thinking because he says he has come in the name of the Lord. The Bible says Jesus speaking, many will come in my name. He says, but by their fruits we shall know them. Do they bear fruits of performing that they say? Do they bear fruits of humility? Because Jesus, when he came, he came as a lowly servant, speaking no pompous words. He says, I do not even speak of my own accord, but I speak as my father speaks. These are signs that you watch out for that you may know who is carrying the mandate of Satan, but wearing the garment of saints. There is a great deception that will cause many to continue to follow the Antichrist without even knowing it. But of course, none of, none of us here because we are his prophets and he's letting us know what is really going on. So let us keep reading. Babylon has a king that also is working for God. He says, the king of Babylon, God was boasting here about Nebuchadnezzar. He was like, oh, king of Babylon, my servant. And the beast of the field I have also given to him to serve him. So all nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son until the time of his land comes and then many nations and great kings shall make him serve them. And it shall be that the nation and the kingdom which will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and which will not put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation I will punish, says the Lord, with the sword, the famine, and pestilence until I have consumed them by his hand. Therefore, like we said on Saturday, do not listen to the false prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your soothsayers, or your sorcerers who speak to you saying, you shall not serve the king of Babylon. Don't listen to them. Those people telling you who to vote for and who not to vote for, don't listen to them. Those people telling you who to love and who to hate, don't listen to them. Simply because the Bible says whether you turn to the left to the right. Literally, whether you turn to the left or to the right. And I'm speaking to the political stronghold that is over this nation. You know, we have the left and we have the right. The Bible says it doesn't matter what your affinities are or what your affiliations have been. Whether you turn to the left or to the right. Why did God say that? I've said this to you before. If you remember, I told you that Babylon culminates in a city that is called what? Shinar. And Shinar means to choose the left or the right. The kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar is an extension of the kingdom of Nimrod. Because Nimrod started Babylon. And so when Nebuchadnezzar came, he came to continue it. It was just another iteration of what will return into power in the last days. It is called mystery Babylon because no one's seen a Babylon like it. And you know why? Because it is a combination of all the kings. And that's the reason why the Bible says even the one that, that was, that is, that wasn't, will be. You see this dude right here? He's here. 
is a man right now that we see on television. His name, I will not tell you in English, but I will remind you of what we just read. He is called my servant. <clears throat> they said Osiris will return. The beast, the Bible says there's a king that is, that wasn't, but that will be. So that means that king will remain. See, like I told you, this update is not for everybody, but it is for you because you are his prophet. My servant shall remain. You know who that is. You know who that is. So, if you don't know, you can ask Alan after the service. That would not be my liability if he chooses to spell it out. But I say that to you because of the fact that it is time that we know what time it is and the people that we're dealing with because this particular king is about to say certain things that will not go well with religious people. And the soothsayers who tried to predict the last election but were exposed by God will come again with another prediction. The diviners will come again to tell us that, oh, this is not of God. But we know the season that we are in, that God is carrying out a test in the world to see who truly is an appointed one. The king of Babylon that God calls his beloved. I said that for the sake of anybody who doesn't know just yet. I didn't use the word servant. I used the word beloved this time around because I have just told you the person's name in English without telling you. You see, the Bible says God has brought all things under his feet. Even the beasts of the field are doing his bidding currently. And the Lord says, because of what I am doing upon the earth, I want you to listen to the king of Babylon. They will tell you it is atrocious. They will tell you it is blasphemy. They will tell you all what not. But you will know because the word of the Lord had already come forth to his prophets saying to them, whether you turn to the left or to the right, you will hear a voice telling you this is the way. The way is to obey the king of Babylon because it is bought for a short while. He is about to become a beast. But until then, let the Lord lead you. Like I told you before, it is not a very general update. It is specific to the prophets. I say to you again, and this is the word of the Lord, because the Lord said it, and the Lord said it again. What did we just read in verse 8? Verse 9 says, therefore, do not listen to your prophets. Um, what did, verse, verse 16, it says, also, I spoke to the priest and to all these people saying, thus says the Lord, do not listen to the words of your prophets who prophesied to you saying, behold, the vessels of the Lord's house will now shortly be brought back from Babylon for they prophesy a lie to you. Can I tell you who these people are? The ones who say to you that before the tribulation, we will be raptured. Now, this is a sacred cow. And this is one of the reasons why the Lord got me to announce on Saturday that he has prepared us and readied us for battle so that we can send the message to the opposition that they need to beware of us. 
We have been aware of them. The Bible says beware of dogs. But now it's time for them to beware of us because a pillar has come. Our strength has come. The Shekinah glory has come. So that they know that we're ready for battle. And that is the reason why we can now call them out. Because we know in the past, when we say things like this, they come for us. Okay, now let them come. <laughs> they would not have taken a step before their mouth is covered with the dust of the ground. The Lord says every step that they take toward you to do you harm will be a burying of themselves in the ground. Because it's a new day. You see, there are times wherein, how many people remember this movie where a man was told that he was the appointed one? They said, oh, you are the one. Um, and he wasn't sure. He kept doubting if he's the one. He said, no, you are the appointed one. And one day, he now did something miraculous. He was able to dodge a bullet. And when he dodged the bullet, he was like, wow, look at me. Maybe I'm the one I've arrived. And the one that was sent to be his Mordecai said to him, he says, by the time you realize who you are, you would not even have to dodge a bullet. <laughs> you see, he was excited because he was like, man, I didn't die today. I dodged a bullet. I have dodged certain bullets in my life for which I am thankful. And I know you standing here are standing here not because Satan has been firing blanks at you. You're standing here because you have been able to dodge some bullets. And the Lord is saying that if by the time we fully realize who we are, we would not even have to dodge the bullets. Why do you want to dodge a bullet that cannot hurt you? You were only dodging the bullet because there was still an element of fear in you of the unknown. The greatest unknown is not a situation or a circumstance that you do not understand. The greatest unknown is who you are in Christ Jesus that you have yet to realize. Because that moment you know who you are, there is no more unknown the moment you know who you are. Because once you know who you are, whatever comes, you will know their name. Just like Adam was able to tell the name of every beast that was brought to him. You see, the moment he realized who he was, then he knew that no weapon fashioned against him shall prosper. So we're not dodging bullets anymore. Right now, let them attempt to come. If they attempt it in one way, the Bible says they will flee in seven ways. For those of you who have seen the movie, you saw that when he dealt a blow to the agent, he split into many beings because he came in one, but he went in several. It's an, when I say that it's a new day, don't just get excited. Get confident. Because you can be excited and still be hiding behind the door. Like, oh, this is awesome. But hey, hey, hey. You know how we, how we get excited. But, but then you're still not confident. Let me tell you something. I would rather be confident than excited. Because you know what happens to confident people? The Bible says confident people produce excitement in others. The Bible says that when a righteous man rises, the city becomes strong. So instead of me getting excited, I will get confident and other people will be excited on my behalf. The moment you rise up in confidence, those people whose destinies are tied to yours, they will get excited. That's what the Bible says. The, come on, praise the Lord. 
The Bible says that the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Not the children of God. Not the babies of God. But the sons. Okay, and daughters. Because when the Bible says sons, it's like when the Bible says man, it means human being. So sons includes mature people. So please don't say you're not coming next week because we're being chauvinistic. They only be talking about man. No. You are a son of God. Hallelujah. And um, I, I, may, I, may, I may have said this before, but if I haven't, let me say this again. You know, God thinks mostly, or he thinks a lot about you from the perspective of the reason why he made you. And why did he make you? He made you and I so that we can be co-heirs with Christ Jesus. He didn't want Jesus to be alone. Because the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So there's only one begotten son. And so because God did not want his begotten son to be alone, he adopted other sons. Romans chapter 8 verse 15 says that it was the Holy Spirit who came to sign the papers of our adoption. The Bible says, for we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And why did he do that? So that we can be heirs of salvation. And to the original audience of prophecy, only sons could inherit. So when you, when you say you're a son of God, you are just acknowledging the fact that you know that all things are yours in Christ Jesus. All right, let's finish here. with We're going to stop in verse 18 today by the grace of God because I think that carries us over. Actually, up until about Tuesday next week. So let's just go to verse 18 and then we'll stop there. But let's read verse 17. 16 again. Also, I spoke to the priest and to all these people saying, Thus says the Lord, do not listen to the words of your prophets who prophesied to you saying, Behold, the vessels of the house of the Lord will now shortly be brought back from Babylon. To be brought back from Babylon, like I said to you, is a prophetic statement describing rapture. They will tell you, oh, don't worry, before the tribulation comes, we will be raptured. But if you get raptured before the tribulation, how are you going to see the people falling on your left and on your right? The Bible says a thousand will fall at your right hand and ten thousand at your left. Only with your eyes will you behold the reward of the wicked. Now, the reward of the wicked will come to them while you are still here because Jesus says, I am coming and my reward is with me to give to each one according to his work. So while the wicked is being rewarded during the tribulation with, a, with an egregious amount of confusion, which is what Babylon means. Babylon means confusion by mixing, when they are receiving their reward, you will still be here because the Bible says they will be falling, they will be dropping around you like flies. Only with your eyes will you behold it. If you are not going to be here, when the ones who rejected Jesus, who is life, when they are receiving their reward, anyone who rejects life, what do they get? Death. So when the angel of death comes to a portion over the sons of disobedience, their judgment, you will still be here. That's why you need the seal of protection so that it doesn't come near you. If I'm not here, I don't need a seal. Multiple times, Psalms 105, the Lord says, I will rebuke kings for your sake and I will put a seal over you. And that was why the Lord says, touch not my anointed. Who was he talking to? You think he's your neighbor? Your neighbor cannot do anything unless they're under the influence of the enemy. Because they're your brothers and your sisters. They were made to be on your side. It is Satan who turns them against you. So when the Lord was saying, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm, he was talking to the angels that hold the wings of destruction and judgment. It's there in Revelations wherein he says, do not release the wind of destruction until word has come to me that the saints have been sealed. So touch not my anointed because I have put a seal on them. That seal is the anointing. 
That seal is the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is your seal unto the day of redemption. So that is the reason why it is important for you and I, Brother Ron, to be led by the Holy Spirit because when we are not led by the voice within and we are only following what the left is saying or what is right is or what the right is saying, we come out from underneath the seal and that will become a target for all forces that have been unleashed. But God forbid that we come out from under the seal of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the seal. So you see the reason why you need to know who you are, that you have been appointed and anointed to function in the power of God by being led by the Holy Spirit, because how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good. If you are going to survive what is coming, you need to have the seal. And what is the seal? It is not a what, it is a who. The seal is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will lead you. The leading of the Holy Spirit is the seal. You know, I once told you that love is the seal because the Holy Spirit is the one that leads you by the love of God. The Bible says the Holy Spirit constrains our hearts by the love of God. And so when you have that seal, you do not have to be afraid. But then at the same time, they will tell you, oh, the rapture must happen before the tribulation because God loves us too much to let us be here. <laughs> Can I take two minutes to quickly explain something to you? The way God demonstrates his love is how? By his power. He said, because I love this, my friend, Abraham. I will deliver his descendants by an outstretched arm. What did, I, what did, we, did we just read in Jeremiah 27? God says, because I want to bring out my outstretched arm, I will first of all empower Nebuchadnezzar. He will work for me. You will obey him so that everything can continue to go in that direction. And then I will say, oops, now I need to bring out my outstretched arm because it's so terrible out there. Because God is waiting for things to get to the point wherein it becomes too difficult even for the saint to remain. Let me say that again, and I will say it confidently. It's not what people out there want to hear. But you that are in here, you have been schooled in the Holy Ghost and in righteousness to rejoice in tribulation. The Bible says that we rejoice in tribulation. And that is the reason why I can tell you this because I know that you are not being depressed right now. You're excited because to go through tribulation is to see prophecy fulfilled and to rejoice like the apostles because the Bible says they rejoiced being counted worthy to suffer the same things that the Lord suffered. You understand what I mean? But the ones out there who are not under the seal of the Holy Spirit, they are afraid. They're excited that Jesus is coming, but they're not confident. And so they're excited, but they're hiding behind doors that do not have the seal of the blood. But you and I, we are confident because we know that yes, the angel of death is coming, but we don't have to worry. Because we know God is ready to bring forth his outstretched arm. That is the reason why he's empowering Nebuchadnezzar. And that is the reason why we will obey the king to help further the agenda of the king so that the end can come quick. You know how this thing works? You are his appointed one. You are an inner inside agent. What, what do they call them? Undercover agent? Because when Nebuchadnezzar says, I want you to make bricks without straw. We're like boom shumba. Because if we decide to protest what the king is saying, then we will be operating in our own flesh. And the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. God is saying, obey Nebuchadnezzar. Don't listen to these prophets telling you not to. I am telling you obey. But now that I have already told you, if you're still wondering, Nebuchadnezzar is reigning right now. Is the head of this one world government. From your perspective, 
Let me say that because I need to clarify. Simply because he, he's about to be overtaken by some other kings. And those other kings will make him bow to them. But by that time, you would have fulfilled your assignment. So, without getting too much into the weeds, I just want you to know that all of what God is doing is doing because he wants to use his power to communicate his love. Praise the Lord. Alrighty. So now let's go to verse 17. He says, do not listen to them, serve the king of Babylon, and live. <laughs> The Lord wants you to live. <laughs> Serve the king of Babylon. You know, it's interesting because one of the things that we do know is this. And I'm going to tell you this very quickly and then move on from verse 17. It says, serve the king of Babylon and live. Because the Bible says that God will cut short the time in those days. Because if he doesn't, not even the elect will make it. And someone is telling you, don't worry, we'll be brought back from Babylon before that happens. Babylon is what? The world system. Mystery Babylon. So say that again. Where are you going to? Yeah, so they're telling you that, oh, you will, be, you will be brought back home. Where is home? So they're telling you that you're going to be taken from Babylon and taken to heaven. Before all of these things happen, and God says, don't listen to them, they're lying. There's nothing like pre tree, but whatever. You will be here, but my seal is going to be on you. I don't have to wear a speedo if I'm not getting in the water. So if, I, if I'm getting a, 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 a seal, it's because I need that protection against what's coming into the world. And the clouds are already forming. Some of y'all are beginning to see it. I've had like three people already in the last couple of days tell me they're seeing the clouds form, bringing the final rain. So what, are we talk what we're talking about here is for now. Okay, 18, and then we're going to stop for today, for now. But if they are prophets, and if the word of the Lord is with them, let them now make intercession to the Lord of hosts that the vessels which are left in the house of the Lord, in the house of the king of Judah, and at Jerusalem, do not go to Babylon. The Lord is saying here, but if they are prophets, and if the word of the Lord is with them, now let them make intercession to the Lord of hosts, that the vessels which are left in the house of the Lord, in the house of the king of Judah, and at Jerusalem, do not go to Babylon. Let me quickly take you, because if you haven't read verses 1 through, through 3, you may not really understand this. So we have maybe two more minutes. Let's quickly look at that. The Bible says in the beginning, verse 1 of Jeremiah 27, in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, thus says the Lord to me, Make for yourself bonds of yokes and put them on your neck and send them to the king of Edom the king of Moab, the king of the Amorites, the king of Tyre, and the king of Sidon, by the hand of messengers who come to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, the king of Judah. Now let me explain something. You see, the Lord is daring the ones who are prophesying to say, okay, if you truly say you have the word of God, Prophesy that the ones who are in Jerusalem will not go to Babylon. The reality of it is this. Even the ones who are in Jerusalem are also under the authority of the king. It is a lot of what these people will attempt to do. They will attempt to make you feel like you are not in Babylon, that you are somewhere else so as to make you feel like your own arm can save you. You see, for those who know that they are in Babylon and that, that the king of Babylon has been empowered, they look only to God for their deliverance. Let no one teach you a strategy for survival that does not include obeying the king because that's the only way to live. So we're going to break bread with Genesis chapter 11, verse 6, 7, 8, and 11. Let's go very quickly because we're breaking bread, so it's going to be very quick. You know when we're breaking bread, we read very quickly, don't we? Jer uh, Josephine is not convinced. 
Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Kenya. I appreciate that. So let's quickly look at Genesis 11. And so before we read Genesis 11, what I want you to pay attention to is that as we're breaking bread today, what the Lord is handing to us, the Lord is giving to us from this Genesis 11 instructions in righteousness of how to maneuver in the days to come. Okay? So let your heart open by wisdom to receive guidance. And for some of us, we still have to learn how to listen through the wall so that even though you're not seeing clearly or you can't even see certain things, you will still be able to receive instructions on how to proceed. Okay, let me say that again, because there are certain people here who might not necessarily be dreamers, who don't see you as much, but you can be led by what you hear, because those words, you will learn how to create pictures from the words that you're hearing. So listen to this. Um, Genesis 11, um, verse 6, the Bible says, and the, Lord, and the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Now, the Lord was talking about the fact that the people were using the most potent power in the world to be in rebellion. What is the most potent power? Agreement. The power of agreement. Okay, Jesus says, whatever you agree on earth, if two of you shall agree on it, heaven is behind you. You are wielding the power, not just of the earth, but the power of heaven. And you know that there is no other place outside of heaven and earth. Because the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That which we refer to as hell is part of the earth. It's like the basement of the earth. That's why it's called the underground, Sheol. So if God is saying that agreement gives you all the power on earth and all the power in heaven, then that is all the power there is. And God is saying, look at them. They're using the power of agreement to be in disobedience. So for those of you who have already come into alignment with the Christ, what do you receive? You receive a restoration of that power. Jesus says, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me, and I give you the authority to wield that power. You understand what I'm saying? And when they heard that, they were excited, but not confident. They were excited, but they still went into hiding. And Jesus was like, I see you. It's okay. He says, because you don't have the power just yet. He says, go and wait until you have received the power from on high. And when did the power come? When they became one. They were in one place and in one accord. So here is the first instruction in righteousness that you are receiving into your body as you take the body and the blood of Jesus today. And that is your feet will not wander away from being in agreement with the brethren. The wolf wants to separate a sheep from the pack so that it becomes easy prey. That's why the Bible says, do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves especially as you see the day approaching. And so, as you receive the body of Jesus today, tell yourself, I will not wander away from being in agreement. I will not listen to familiar spirits that make me sound different from other prophets. I will not listen to the machining of the devil that is arrayed against me to cause me to be self-confident in myself rather than being confident in what God is doing with the ecclesia. I will not become cocky. I will not become proud. I will not become full of myself. But I will humble myself under the mighty hand of God because I am part of of the beloved. It is important because what Satan will do is Satan will begin to whisper to people in the body and say to them, oh, you don't need these people. Why would you let somebody talk to you like that? How come it's this person that always has a word? What about what I have been telling you? And then you will think that you're hearing something that is different. The enemy 
We'll try to lure people, but none of us here by the grace of God because we are under the seal of the Holy Spirit. But I say to you, if you're watching and you are one that has already been isolated by Satan from being in fellowship, Satan told you you don't need the body because they're full of broken people. Satan told you that you just need to be spiritual. You don't have to be religious. I say to you, you don't have to be religious. You don't even have to be spiritual. You just need to be obedient. Be obedient to the heavenly calling that says to not forsake the gathering together of, your, of yourselves. Find the company of believers and be in one place with them and in one accord. We will not be led astray. Okay, I've I've received a detour. You see, because okay, let's just keep going. I said we're going to read verse six and which other one? Okay, let's just keep going. The Bible says, "Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language." But Babylon confusion that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad. From there over the face of the earth and they ceased building the city. If I let me just take you very quickly to, um, I think we skipped uh, verse 3. Verse 3 says, verse 2 and 3. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Shinar is what we've been talking about, left or right. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. So um, we will stop on this one. There is other things, but maybe we'll get to it later. I'm being mindful of time now. Um, Jeremiah 27, don't listen to them. Why? Because they are trying to create a movement. They are trying to create their own ecclesia outside of the body of Christ. People are doing it using political platforms, religious platforms. Uh, they're using, when I say religious platforms, it doesn't look like religion, but it is religion, but it is essentially sanctimony. When people announce to you what you seem to be doing good at and tell you that anybody that is not doing that which you are doing is wrong. So basically creating a sect and so when this happens, they are making bricks instead of stones. They're trying to get everybody to come into conformity, to come into the same shape and to the same order. Let me now explain it using plain language. There is a religious voice that has gone into the world today that says, if you don't vote what I vote, you must be a demon. A consensus of opinion will never replace genuine revelation by the Holy Spirit. This is the way the Lord showed it to me. They built a tent and fortified it. And they said, if you come into this tent, you'll be safe. But the Lord is saying, I don't need you to go into someone else's tent. I need you to stay where I have put you. Just put the seal on the door. Don't let anybody. Now, see, Okay, I'm going to take two minutes and quickly explain this. You see, what is going on in the world today is such that the enemy is looking to use the ministry of the false prophet extensively. You know, there is a false prophet that is the forerunner of the Antichrist. Like John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ. And to be a forerunner, you need to have the power of conviction. Because for 400 years, the Bible says there was no word from heaven. 400 years until the angel Gabriel came to say to Mary, you will bear a son. Until he went to Elizabeth and said, you will carry the forerunner. Until he said to Zechariah, a son will be born and his name is John. The same angel Gabriel went to Joseph and said, we got you. You will be fine. You will go to Egypt, but you will come out with a child and you will be okay. You see, until that time, the Bible says for 400 years, there was no word from God. How then was John the beloved able to have disciples and begin a revival? He had to have been speaking with a great conviction. 
he was asking men to, be, to come to the Jordan. And we know the Jordan is like a dirty stream. Nobody wants to go to the Jordan. Have you read in your Bible anyone who was asked to go to the Jordan to, to get baptized or to wash? Who got excited about it? Even a leper, a leper, Naaman who was a leper. I mean, if you were a leper, if they tell you to jump in, a, in an incinerator, you should do it happily because how much worse can things get for you? But Naaman was like, are not Abana and Fapa, the rivers of Damascus, even Damascus that's supposed to be a wilderness, the tiny little rivers that they have, are they not better than all the rivers in Israel? Can I not wash in them and be made whole? He said, but nevertheless, at your word. And the Bible says he went into the Jordan and he was made whole. What does that mean? Nevertheless, at your word. If you find that in scripture, it is a salutation for the Holy Spirit. Whenever you see nevertheless at your word, it is the heart of man acknowledging the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Every time you see people say nevertheless at your word, that is what is happening. And so when he said nevertheless at your word, he acknowledged the ministry of the Holy Spirit and he was made whole. So I say to you that people are coming to the body in the spirit of the false prophets and they are very convincing. Your friends who are following them are not gullible. It is just that the first prophet is convincing. And the word of the Lord is this. If they once convinced an entire civilization of men, which was the whole world at the time, to replace stone with bricks, they would do it again. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You see, the Lord said to me that we need to open the veil so that y'all can get it. Come with me to Romans chapter 1 verse 9. Let's peel off another layer real quick and then we'll break bread. Romans chapter 1 verse 9. Look at what it says. And I'm so happy we finished early on Saturday because that 30 minutes, we're, paying for, we're, we're getting it back. Yeah. In, in case you thought it was gone. No, I was, I was saving it. Yeah. In fact, I just remembered, and I'm like, why am I even in a hurry? You all owe me like an hour. <laughs> the Bible says, for God is my witness, Romans chapter 1 verse 9, whom I serve in my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayer, making request, if by some means now, at least I may found a way in the will of God to come to you. Now in the will of God, I will find a way to come to you. Now let me explain this. You see, guard your heart with all diligence. The one that needs to reach you by God will reach you. But you see all those people out there that are speaking with the tongue of the false prophets, you must not listen to them. This is the word of the Lord. And you know what God specifically said to Jeremiah? He says, tell them not to listen to their prophets. That means they are people that have been registered in the minds of the people since they were children to be the voices to listen to. And that is why Satan is using the same people because they already carry the credentials that convince others. Jesus says, don't look at their credentials. He says, look at their fruits. So one more thing that we're going to bring from Genesis 11. So now let's go back to that same Genesis 11 and I just remembered now. We're going to read verse 17 and we're going to quickly break it down into two or three, maybe three places, and then we're going to finally break this bread. The Bible says in Genesis eleven seventeen, after he begot Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and begot sons and daughters. After what? He begot Peleg. How many people remember what Peleg means? To be divided. To be separated. Now, after he begot Peleg, Eber 
I want to just quickly look up here that word so that you can make a note of it. It literally means division, separation. And after he begot Peleg, the Bible says Eber continued to be what? He, he remained. Now, let me just quickly explain this. You see the significance of Peleg is about to be reversed. And I'm going to just explain it very briefly because this is one of those things that will be in the news and many people will just gloss over it. Why was Peleg important? The Bible says because they were operating in rebellion, even though they had tapped into the power of agreement, which is the most potent power, God wanted to make sure that they do not take that power again unless he brought it. So what did he do? He divided the land. He physically separated the land. And that's why we have continents. Okay? So there were no continents until the separation of the languages. How do I know that? In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says God commanded the land to be in one place. Right? The Bible says the land was in one place and it was called earth. It was not called lands. It was called earth. And after that, what do you see? After Genesis 11, the Bible will say through all the lands, through all the lands. Because it is no longer just one earth. It's been broken down into continents. So that separation, that physical separation was to ensure that God terminated the rebellion. They're separated by seas. When Jesus comes, they will be united again. If you haven't read it in scripture, the new earth does not have seas because all the lands are brought together again. There's just going to be one continent. You understand what I mean? Now, so let me say this. <laughs> you see, the... Ah, okay. This is, like I said... Some of it is already in the news, but it's going to come out even more. When Peleg was born, Eber continued to live. Eber means the other side or the region far beyond, right? So what's going to happen is this. The devil wants to reunite the world to be one again. Are you with me? And when the devil's one world government begins to operate, those of us who are on the other side because we have been translated from here to the land beyond, we will still remain. And why am I telling you that today? I am telling you that today because the Lord said to me that the hearts in this room need to be fortified against the lie of the enemy that would tell you to turn your back on the king because there is a rapture or there is an exit before the agenda of the one world government comes bringing tribulation. So when you know that after Peleg is reversed, which is after the division is reversed, which is a reunion, guess what's going to happen? There's going to be bricks again. And I already told you, there's bricks now, the new money. is called bricks. That is only a shadow of what's to come. There's going to be bricks and mortar. Bricks and asphalt, sorry. So, in plain English, we will witness, and this is prophecy that's already written, so don't come after me. We will be here when they successfully announce the coronation of the Antichrist over the one world government with the new money but we will not be afraid. You know why? Because we know that God is bringing them into the boxing ring so that he can stretch out his hands. 
because he brought them to the boxing ring in Shinar and dealt a blow on them so much so that the land shook and the continents were formed. God wants to do a new thing upon the earth and that is the reason why Jesus says when you see the earthquake, look up. Until the earth begins to move, we know we're still here because we are Eber. We are the ones from beyond. So folks, we're going to break bread today but there's one more, one more announcement that I need to make. The Lord said to me to say to you that your garment will be mended. Let me say that again. Your garment will be mended. What is your garment? Your righteousness. You see, many of us have had impacts in our lives that make us question who we are because of how we have been. The Lord says, I will mend those garments. And when the Lord mends the garment, you will become confident. You see, the reason why some of us are not as confident is because we feel that a part of us is exposed. Some of us feel exposed maritally. Some of us feel exposed financially. Some of us feel exposed in being in faithfulness and consistency. And the Lord says, I need you to be confident, so I am going to mend your garment. You see, because the moment the Lord mends your garment and you become confident, then nothing that is going on in the world, whether it is shaking or not, will shake you. As we break bread today, I have one ask of you. I want to plead with you. Present yourself to the Lord as the offering, as the sacrifice. And say to the Lord, Lord, receive me. I want you to bring yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, receive me. Let us eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. Praise the Lord. Alrighty, so before we close out, I want you to be able to meditate on these things when you get home. When the Lord says to say to you, the Lord received me. In that moment, it took me to a place. And it was the tabernacle in the wilderness. I have been there a couple of times before. As soon as I got there, I recognized where I was. And in the tabernacle in the wilderness, if you read in the Old Testament, the Bible says that they were not allowed to bring animals that have blemish. Let's do something very quickly. Can I have everybody on that side come in here? Just come and take a seat here temporarily. Everybody in the booth there, including Gavin, let everybody, well, let, let all of us come here very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. I know it's a little inconvenient, especially when you're getting ready to go home. It is my little plan to make it feel like you just got here so that we can start a second service. Shayla, really? <laughs> All righty. So, you know, I've been training and I've been telling you for some time to learn how to move with the cloud. Even today, I was nicer. I told you I was peeling the layers. And when it seems as if I'm getting a little deep on you, it's because some deep things are going on. So now let me just quickly brief you on where I have been in the last couple of minutes. I was still talking, but I was elsewhere. I was at the tabernacle in the wilderness. And I saw the animals being brought. And the Lord said to me, I do not accept animals with blemishes. The Lord said to me, I do not accept animals with blemishes. The Bible says that Jesus is coming for an ecclesia 
that is spotless, that has no blemish. But I stood there and I saw, just as you all are gathered here, a number of sacrificial lambs that were being brought, but they had blemishes. And he said to me, this is the reason why I had you prophesying over your brothers and sisters that it is time for them to learn how to read from left, from right to left, as well as from left to right. He said to me, left to right, I hope you got it. Those of us who are left will be made right, but let's keep going. You see, many got to that same place and turned back because they found themselves unfit for the Lord. By their own assessment, they turned. But for those of us that remained, you know why we remain? We remained because we are Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is the son of Ilkahiah. When you are the son of Ilkahiah, you know that the Lord is your portion in the land of the living. So even though you have a blemish, who are you returning to? Jesus said to his disciples, others have gone. Why are you still staying in here? They said, because we have nowhere to go. You have become a portion in the land of the living. You are here today because your heart knows you have nowhere else to go. You have no other God but him. Even though you've had reasons to doubt the call of God upon your life. Even though men have told you that you're not fit for the kingdom. Even though you have been rejected from certain circles. But something within you tells you like you told Apostle Paul. I am accepted in the beloved. I may have a blemish. But to whom shall I return? Because there are certain times that the Lord allows for me to ask questions. Because I'm like, okay, I know you brought these people here today for this purpose. But can you please tell me what your selection is based on? And he took me to the tabernacle. And he said, these ones that remain from right to left, I do not accept blemishes. But from left to right, if I accept them, then their blemishes would have to go. So put it this way. The moment you cross the line into the Lord's yard, into the inner courts, Every animal of sacrifice in the inner court has no blemish. And so if you are here and you have blemish and the Lord accepts you because you are accepted in the beloved, you will cease to have blemish. And that was what he was preparing you for when we finally got to that place and he said to me, now tell them to declare that they are the sacrificial lambs. That was why he says, say that I am the sacrifice. Today, I am the one. The moment you presented yourself as the sacrifice, you were cleansed of all blemish. He said, I will mend your garment. You see, this is one of those messages that as I was coming here, the Lord said to me, what if it takes a year? To come to pass. I said, but Lord, eventually, as long as it comes to pass, it's okay. And what am I saying? What I am saying is this. There are certain things that have been said in here today that you will need a year from now. Just arm yourself with it. It's coming. But I tell you what, the garment that was mended was the blemish that needed to be taken care of. The Lord has one instruction, one purpose for us today. And you know what that is? In case you have not been listening or you've, you want to go listen again, I'll just tell you. It is so that you can walk out of here confident, knowing fully well that the seal of the Lord is upon you so that you can prophesy as his appointed one 
and you become the answer to prayers. I'm going to give us one more scripture, two, and we're going to go home. Matthew 6, 6. Don't worry, I'm just going to read it very quickly. And Matthew 6, 18. The reason why this is important is this. You see, Matthew chapter 6. Gavin, just sit down. I'm just going to read it, but thank you. Thank you for getting up, but I just want you to remain where you are. You see, because what we're doing is very prophetic. Because uh, there is a king that remains. And we are the ones that are remain, even though we are from the other side. Yeah. <clears throat> so Matthew 6, 6 and 6, 18. I'm going to read them together. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who sees in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Verse 18 says, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you in the open. I'm going to tell you three reasons why I'm reading this because I, there are things that I am seeing. You have become a new man today because now you put away childish things. The Lord says, do not say that you're a youth. So what's going on right now is the Lord wants you to have an opportunity to meet the new man that you have become in the secret place. It is not time yet to take this new man out there and be saying, where are they? I want to prophesy. Where are they? I have now been appointed to be an answer to prayers. Let me tell you something. Because the danger of just becoming a new man and then immediately jumping out is very severe. You have, you have become new, but you are still getting situated in who you are in Christ Jesus. Be confident that he will reward you in the open. But he wants you to familiarize yourself with the new man in secret. But wait a minute though. In case you missed what I just read. I read 6 and 18 for your purpose. Can anybody guess? You know, they practically said the same thing. That your father who sees in secret shall reward you in the open. Alan, be getting ready to come and bless the offering. But the reason why the Lord will have you hear both of them side by side is this. This is the part that some people may not like too well, but because you have become a new man, you will like it. Verse 6 says when you pray. Verse 18 says when you fast. Strengthen this new man with prayer and fasting. God bless you. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord. What a night tonight. Ain't you glad you came? We'll have the offering slide on screen in just a bit. Let's give him faith for what the Lord has done tonight. What a night of equipping. Truly deep has called unto deep. Father, we give you praise. Hallelujah. So to our family online, there are several ways to give, even here. On Cash App, Dollar Sign Communion House. PayPal, at Communion House. You'll also see the Zelle giving information, the phone number there. And if you'd like an envelope here, we have it here on my right, your left, if you'd like to give that way. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. Praise the Lord. Uh, just very quickly, if you want an attestation, let us, let it, let us bow our heads, everybody. And um, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit. The power of conviction that convicts the world of sin and of righteousness, even the believer. Um, Father, we thank you. So today, 
And also, it is today, whatever day you listen to it, if you're online. So if you're here, and for those online, today, if you're saying, you know what? I have heard what the Lord is saying to me, even as this servant delivered, as this oracle spoke, I, he, I heard God in my own heart, calling me to come to the foot of the cross. And today, I want to say that, yes, I am studying a new life in Christ Jesus. If that is you, if you're here, I want you to come forward. If you're watching online, I want you to kneel wherever you might be as a symbol of recognizing that you are at the foot of the cross, that you have come to the Savior who alone can save. And let the Lord receive you as the offering. In the mighty name of Jesus. If you're here and you want to come forward, come forward right now. But if you're watching and you're listening and you want to kneel, kneel right now. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Here is the attestation. Today, this one's become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And I want you to say with me, if that is you and you have said, today I am turning a new leaf with the Lord Jesus. I want you to say, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. Jesus, take me by the hand and never let me go. Wherever you lead, I will go because you will help me by your Holy Spirit who is the helper. Receive me as that offering. And I receive the new life that you gave. I awake unto righteousness. I I awake unto righteousness, never to go back into sins, because you have set me free. In the name of Jesus, amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Hallelujah. 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 By now, <laughs> we should have our given details. Of the given details on the screen, Father, we give you praise. Father, we thank you for this time of encountering you tonight, you meeting with us. Father, we give you praise for you have made us new. Let these offerings unto you, O oh God, as we give in faith, as we give in obedience, be pleasing unto you. We thank you, O oh God, for you have made this a new day in our lives, O oh God, a new season unto us, bringing glory to your name. We declare that all glory, honor, and power and might belong to you. And we all said, amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord on tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, don't forget... Tomorrow night, Wednesday, 9 p.m., we'll be back at it, pressing in in prayer. We have received the charge tonight to pray and to fast. And so we give God praise for the Holy Spirit will be leading us into how he is calling each and every one of us to do that thing, what it looks like for us at this season in our lives. Everyone have a blessed night, and we'll see you soon.